Hello, welcome to CBA. This is our top stories with me, Hamza Dabchiri. Somaliland says voter registration exercise in Seoul region on the peak numbers. Somalia's international partners call for dialogue to end political disagreements. Somalia government will open its major role in Mogadishu closing over terrorist attacks. Ethiopia warns Sudan over military peel up border tensions. Uganda election is government deploys heavy military to Kampala ahead of port. Welcome to CBA. Somaliland government has affirmed that the voter registration process in Seoul is progressing well and the turn up is higher. Somaliland is expected to hold parliamentary and local council elections this year. The Minister of Somaliland's Internal Affairs, Mohamed Kahin, has commented on the voter registration process in Seoul region and other eastern constituencies where the voter registration is undergoing. He highlighted that the people of Eastern and constituencies, including Lhasa North, are participating well in the voter registration exercise and eligible citizens are turning up in numbers. He also said that the Somaliland security forces are also performing well and securing their located voter registration sites. <laughs> The voter registration exercise in those constituencies are progressing well. The constituencies in Sanag region include Las Ore, Badan, and Tahar. While in Seoul, there is Las Arnod, the administrative city of Seoul region, Hudun, and Taleh. This voter registration exercise have reached the constituencies that never participated in the voter registration exercise before. According to the National Electoral Commission, only those who did not get the previous voter cards as well as who have reached the age of the 14, and those who lost their cards will be eligible to take part in this voter registration exercise. Somaliland is expected to hold parliamentary and city council elections in this year, where every citizen will vote for his favorite candidates. Somalia international partners have called for a dialogue to end the political standoff between Somali government and some of the country's political stakeholders. In a statement, the international community said proudly inclusive understanding is on implementation of the September 17th election model are needed to ensure the credibility of this process. According to a statement, Somalia's international partners said late Tuesday that they are deeply concerned over the continuing impasse in implementing the electoral model agreed on September 17th last year by President Mohamed Abdullahi Farmacho, the other leaders of all states. The international partners of Somalia loaded the efforts by the government to resolve the difference in a way to hold credible elections in the country, and the statement read is that the international partners appreciate recent initiatives. In particular, they welcome the visit of Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Roble to Galmuduk and Butlan. The discussion is among a wide range of senior Somali leaders hosted in Garoway by Putlan President Saeed Abdullahi Dhani. And the outreach by Galmuduk President Ahmed Abdi Kariya Qorqor, who conveyed proposals from Groe to federal government of Somalia leaders and other political figures. They said the spirit of dialogue and compromise which led to the signing of the 17th September agreement must be sustained to move the electoral process forward. The international partners warned against any threat or use of violence is not acceptable. They also emphasized the importance of free and open political space in which candidates are able to express their views peacefully and the media are able to operate without Restriction. The federal government of Somalia has reopened a major road in Mogadishu, which is in Kilometer 4, that links to the Criminal Investigation Center. The security forces declared that the public will use this road from now on. Years after peace in Mogadishu road is where closed causing traffic snarl up is. Somalia on Tuesday reopened a major street that links to the Criminal Investigation Center that had been blocked to contain terror attacks from Al-Shabaab. 
Satik Adam Ali, the Somali's police spokesman, explaining in death what motivated to reopen this road at this time, said that they had received complaints from the different sections of Mogadishu community. He also sent rebuke to the business community in Mogadishu, who closed the road to protect the safety of their business and called on them to reopen or the police will take action towards the road is closed by the privately owned business community. For the past year, the Somalia security force is reopening major roads in the country that had been blocked for security purposes. Residents in Mogadishu have strongly welcomed the move and demanded the reopening of many more. The Al-Shabaab militants have almost taken control of Mandera County in northeastern Kenya, Governor Ali Foba has claimed, which could precipitate is with actions by the government of Kenya, which has also struggled to contain violent extremism. In a letter dispatched to newsrooms, the second term governor said the simmering security crisis was caused by the undeterred movement of the terrorists within the county, despite the heavy presence of security forces in the region. The situation has been worsening over the last three months, but has now reached unprecedented levels, said Governor Robo in a passionate appeal for help. The terrorists have been collecting livestock by force from helpless pastoralists in the name of Zaka. Mandera, Wajir and Garissa witnessed over 30 Al-Shabaab-related attacks last year, with non-local security forces and innocent civilians being the most affected. There is a need for change of approach in how we deal with this situation, otherwise we will soon be under the rule of the terrorists. Already, Al-Shabaab manages more than 60% of Mandera with the will of the public suppressed by terror, said Governor Roba. Omar Adenbul, an assistant chief who was vocal against Al-Shabaab, he noted, was abducted on December 18th and beheaded in the cruelest manner in Wajir County. Along the border with Mandera, his head was then thrown into a bush. The government has failed to completely protect northern Kenya from Al-Shabaab. As it stands, the ugly truth is that Al-Shabaab has taken control over 50% of the landmass of northern Kenya. The public must now stand up and help the government by all means possible to get rid of this terror group. For several years, the Rapid Response Unit, Border Patrol Unit and the Special Forces from the KDF have been manning the region. There are several forward operating bases in the region that host the Kenya Defence Forces who are deployed to northeastern Kenya. The government, he said, should ensure that the militants whose major base is in Somalia are flushed out of the country for the sake of peace and stability. He noted that despite the presence of security forces, the situation still remains fluid. However, the increased presence presence of our security personnel has not deterred the movement of al-Shabaab in northern Kenya. The government should do everything to kick out al-Shabaab. We refuse to be ruled in independent Kenya by this militia. Tension is over long-standing feud over disputed al-Fashqa region come amid new impasse in three-way dispute over Megatam. At least six people in eastern Sudan were killed in an attack by an Ethiopian militia, authorities said in a statement on Tuesday. Ethiopia's accused Sudanese forces of pushing further into a contested border region that has been a set of deadly clashes in recent weeks, warning that its peaceful approach to the dispute has limits. Sharing a 1,600-kilometer frontier, the two neighboring countries have long feuded over the al fashqa region, where Ethiopian farmers cultivate fertile land claimed by Sudan. The border tensions come at a time when Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt are also trying to resolve the three-way dispute over the controversial dam Ethiopia is building on the Blue Nile, known as the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. The Sudanese side seems to be pushing so as to inflame the Ethiopian situation on the ground. In early December, Sudan accused Ethiopian forces and militias of ambushing Sudanese troops along the border, more than 20 wounded. Ethiopia for its part said last week that Sudan's military had organized attacks by using heavy machinery guns and that many civilians have been murdered and wounded. Sudan's information minister and government spokesman Faisal Mohamed Salah said the country did not want war with Ethiopia but its forces will respond to any aggression. On December 31st, Sudan said it has taken control of all the Sudanese territory in the area. Ethiopia says Sudan took advantage of its forces being distracted by the conflict in the Tigray, northern Ethiopia, to occupy Ethiopian land and looted properties. The United Nations said in a report last week the humanitarian situation in Tigray that there were reports of military build up on both sides of the border around the area. The Tigray conflict has spurred tens of thousands of Ethiopian refugees to cross into Sudan. Separately, Ethiopia and Egypt said on Sunday that they reached a new phase in the dispute over Jared. Egypt and Ethiopia separately blamed Sudan objections to the framework of the talks. Ethiopia sees the dam as the key to plans to overcome Africa's largest power exporter. Egypt, which gets more than 90% of its scarce fresh water from the Nile, fears the dam across the Blue Nile could devastate its economy. Sudan worries the project would affect its own dams, though it stands to benefit from access to possible cheap electricity. And now let's go to Uganda. 
In a letter, Uganda's communication regulator ordered internet service providers to block all social media platforms and messaging apps until further notice. Uganda has banned social media and beefed up security in the capital on Tuesday, two days ahead of a presidential election. Campaigning ahead of the vote has been marred by brutal crackdowns on opposition rallies that have left scores dead and the repeated intimidation and arrest of some of the opposition candidates, their supporters and campaign staff. Videos posted on social media on Tuesday showed a convoy of armored military vehicles heading towards Kampala and then moving slowly through various streets in the heart of the capital, which typically votes against Museveni. In a television address on Tuesday morning, the 76-year-old leader who took power in 1986 said he had met with the security forces and they were ready to defend any Ugandans worried about coming out to vote because of intimidation by the opposition. There have been practices of intimidation. Well, especially the opposition people, have been threatening people not to come out and vote. In some areas, they have even attacked peaceful citizens. The European Union said on Tuesday it expected Uganda to provide a level playing field for all voters to exercise their democratic rights without fear of intimidation or violence. Human rights uh, colleagues said today they are deeply concerned by the deteriorating human rights situation in Uganda ahead of the parliamentary and presidential election scheduled for January 14th. Between the 18th and 20th of November, at least 54 people were killed during riots and protests in at least seven districts across the country, and the arrest and detention of two opposition presidential candidates and members of the political opposition. UN Human Rights Office called on authorities to protect the rights of freedom of expression and peaceful assembly and to ensure free and peaceful elections that guarantees the rights of the people in Uganda to participate in the country's public affairs, including taking measures to prevent instances of electoral violence. The EU's top diplomat, Joseph Burrell, said the excessive use of force by law enforcement and security agencies has seriously tarnished the electoral process. He said the bloc's offer to deploy a small team of electoral experts was not taken up. Museveni apologized for the inconvenience caused by the ban on social media and messaging apps, but he said Uganda had no choice after Facebook took down some accounts which backed his ruling National Resistance Movement Party. Social channel you are talking about, if it is going to operate in Uganda, it should be used equitably by everybody who has to use it. If you want to take sides against the NRM, then that group would not operate in Uganda. Uganda is ours, it's not anybody's. Those Facebook and those groups did not respond, I hear, and I'm sure the government has closed the social media. Those channels of Facebook and I don't know which one. But I'm very sorry about the inconvenience to those who have been using this, this ch channel. Even myself, when I had time, I, I was interacting with the young people uh, through it. But we cannot tolerate uh, this arrogance of anybody coming to decide for us who is good and who is bad. That's all we cannot accept. In a letter that was seen by Reuters to internet service providers dated January 12th, Uganda's communications regulator ordered them to block all social media platforms and messaging apps until further notice. Internet monitor NetBlock said its data showed that Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Instagram, Skype, Snapchat, Viber and Google Play Store were among a lengthy list of sites unavailable via Uganda's main cell network operators. Facebook said on Monday it had taken down a network link to Uganda's Ministry of Information for using fake and duplicate accounts to post ahead of this week's election. The internet service providers were also given a list by the UCC of 100 virtual private networks to block. Tomorrow, Thursday, January 14, Ugandans will convert in different polling stations to vote for their respective candidates in the country's general election. Bobby Wine and Yuweri Museveni are the top candidates for the presidential election tomorrow. Tomorrow, Thursday, January 14th, Ugandans will converge in different polling stations to vote for their respective candidates in the country's general election. Bobby Wine and Yuweri Museveni are the top candidates for presidential election tomorrow. It has been a grueling campaign period with the notable presidential candidates being incumbent Yoram Museveni and opposition candidate Robert Kianguleni aka Bobby Wine. Museveni and his allies have often accused Wine of trying to polarize and destabilize the country's peace with the help of foreigners. On his part, Wine lamented Museveni's use of force to intimidate and frustrate his campaigns. There was, however, no campaigning in the country today as the official period elapsed yesterday, January 12th. The government sent a strong message that its security forces were ready to go if the heavy military presence in the streets of Kampala was anything to go by. Apart from those in military trucks, several army men in full gear had dispatched to patrol the streets. 
streets that have been known as violence hotspots during past elections. Speaking to media, Kampala Metropolitan Police spokesman Patrick Onyango explained that the government has upgraded its security machinery and deployed both regular police as well as the army. The spokesman added that the security forces have undergone a host of active drills relevant for violent riots, cyber harassment, radical youth groups and clashes between rival groups. Minister of Defense and Veteran Affairs has also sent out a warning that calls candidates must accept the results as they are announced by Electoral Commission or face the consequences. He reiterated that those who will have complaints about the results should table them before the court of law, but not consider the violence option, with benefit of hindsight and following the heavy military presence. The U.S. Embassy in Uganda has urged its members to be on high alert and stay clear of crowds. Seven will be pitched against ten other candidates in a bid to push his term, which has lasted over 30 years, for another five. Ugandan President Yoweri Museferi has reacted to foreign criticism of his government, saying Ugandans, sovereignty and people should be respected by the international community. Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni has reacted to foreign criticism of his government, saying Uganda's sovereignty and people should be respected by the international community. The Ugandan President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni accused a foreign groups interfering in its domestic affairs by deciding who is good and who is bad, though he never revealed their names. This is unfortunate, but it is unavoidable. There is no, no way anybody can come and play around with our, our, our country to decide who is good, who is bad. This one we will stop, this one we, we cannot accept that. His reaction comes barely a few hours after Uganda's communication regulator had ordered internet service providers to shut down social media and messaging services. The list of the banned social media sites include Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Signal and Viber. While security forces have cracked down on the opposition at previous polls, the run-up to this year's vote has been especially violent. In November, 54 people were killed as soldiers and police quelled protests after Bobby Wine was imprisoned. Some six-year-old Museveni further blamed the opposition, especially the musician-turned-politician Bobby Wine, for not respecting the COVID-19 measures during his campaign rallies. They were defying the regulation of not congregating and they, and they were gathering sizable numbers of people which of course would facilitate infection. Meanwhile, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Waterres has called on Ugandan authorities, particularly the security forces, to respect human rights in the run-up to the presidential election after one of the bloodiest election campaigns in decades. The vote on Thursday will come after one of the bloodiest campaigns in years, as veteran leader Yuri Museveni seeks six time against Bobby Wine, who has managed to fire up a youthful population that has mostly known only one president. Kamil Sadiq, CBA TV. It is understood that more cases of the South African variant of COVID-19 have been discovered in the UK despite the lack of an official announcement two cases of another new variant of coronavirus here in the UK. Both are cases, both are contacts of cases who have travelled from South Africa over the past few weeks. First, we are quarantining cases and close contacts of cases found here in the UK. Second, we're placing immediate restrictions on travel from South Africa. And finally, and most importantly, Anyone in the UK who has been in South Africa in the past fortnight and anyone who is a close contact of someone who's been in South Africa in the last fortnight must quarantine immediately. The South African variant of COVID-19, alleged to be more transmissible than any other mutation of the virus so far, has infected a small number of individuals in the UK and it's believed that there are more people now infected with this strain than the only other two cases officially announced in December. Jeremy Hunt is the former British Health Secretary. He said earlier this week that the South African variant is now taking root inside the country after cases were detected in London and the northwest of England, respectively. There are fears that this version of coronavirus is vaccine resistant, although both PIVISA and the scientific community have played down this threat in recent weeks. Hunt 
who now chairs the House of Commons Health Committee, also believes that the NHS can just about withstand the onslaught of new cases in Blighty, but the South African mutation will ensure that the scramble for capacity goes down to the wire. Elsewhere, Germany became the latest country to confirm the appearance of the South African variant of COVID-19 on Wednesday. A traveller who returned from a long stay in Mzanzi went home to the province of baden wittenberg and following a second set of tests, the mutation was picked up by regional health authorities. Malawian President Shakawera has declared a state of disaster in address to the nation delivered hours after two cabinet ministers died from COVID-19 amid a spike in coronavirus infections. Fellow Malawians, we presently find ourselves in one of the darkest hours in our nation's history. Malawian President Lazarus Chakwera has declared a state of disaster in an address to the nation delivered hours after two cabinet ministers died from COVID-19 amid a spike in coronavirus infections. The Malawian government confirmed that Transport Minister Sidik Maya and local government minister Linksin Berekenyama both succumbed to the virus in the early hours of Tuesday after a long-term battle. COVID-19's crusade of death claimed the lives of two high-ranking government officials, Honorables Linkson Berekanyama and Mohamed Sidik Mia, who were serving in my cabinet as ministers of local government and transport, respectively. We all feel this as an incalculable loss, and our grief and devastation in the wake of these deaths cannot be measured. The country's president has since declared a three-day period of mourning and he has directed that all national flags across the country should fly at upmast in respect of the government officials and citizens that the country has lost to the pandemic. The Malawi leader has also directed ministries of health, homeland security, education, civil education, local government and justice to work together with the Vice President Salos Chilima to consider amendment of the country's COVID-19 guidelines. I have called for an emergency meeting of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, which has thus far done a commendable job of providing expert guidance on our fight against the spread of this virus. The emergency meeting will explore additional measures to be effective immediately in view of my declaration of a state of national disaster across the country. Additionally, that meeting will establish a method for measuring and declaring the shifting severity of the pandemic by the use of numerical levels with preventative and curative measures stipulated for each level to guide public awareness and behavior. I want to assure you, everyone, that the full weight and authority of my office will be brought to bear on the task force interventions and regular public updates on what has been done, what is being done, and what is yet to be done in our fight against this invisible enemy. This task force has my full support and participation, and I expect that it will have the full cooperation of all citizens. Schools and all learning institutions are open in Malawi despite confirmed cases of COVID-19 being reported in some of the institutions and universities. Meanwhile, the president has called for more assistance from the international community, relevant UN agencies, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector for uncommon contributions towards the resources needed to meet the present challenges posed by the pandemic. Over 9,000 cases have been recorded in Malawi since April 2020, and over 2,000 of these cases have been reported in the month of January alone. Kamil Sadiq reporting for CBA TV. A combined team of soldiers and local vigilant 
outfit yesterday repelled a panties attack on arena a town in shiroro local government area of niche state in a fierce battle which an eyewitness said lasted for close to four hours the bandits reported they lost four of their men but no casualty was reported on the part of the soldiers on the local security men however a truck belonging to the soldiers were said to have been set on fire by the bandits as they fled the battlefield. The bandits and their numbers who were riding on motorcycles, according to the eyewitness, attempted to storm the town at about 4 a.m., but the soldiers and the vigilance group who were in the Governance Day Secondary School buildings in the arena were not caught unaware. The spokesman for the Shiroro Youth Forum, Malam Bello Ibrahim, who confirmed the incident in a telephone conversation, said he can confirm that in the early hours of yesterday, terrorists in their large numbers stormed Arena Town in an attempt to unleash terror on their defenseless, peaceful and unsuspecting people. The terrorists, however, met a vehemently resistant security joint task force comprising conventional security and local vigilantes stationed at the Government Day Secondary School in Arena. They engaged them in a fierce gun battle which lasted for hours and consequently the criminals couldn't gain access into the town. There were sporadic gunshots which could be heard all over the area. Ibrahim further confirmed that a vehicle belonging to the gallant security men was seen to have been burnt but explained that the attack was however repelled by the security agent. Neither the police nor the army securities could be reached to confirm the incident. Meanwhile, it was not known when the military base was returned to Arena Town, but in the wake of weekly attacks on the town and neighboring communities, the senator representing the district, Alaji San Musa, had pleaded with President Muhammad Buhari to set up a military base in the area for quick response to distress called by the villagers. The House has voted to formally call on Vice President Mike Benz to invoke the 25th Amendment and strip Donald Trump of his presidential authority after he incited a mob that led a deadly assault on the U.S. Capitol last week. The House has voted to formally call on Vice President Mike Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment and strip Donald Trump of his presidential authority after he cited a mob that led a deadly assault on the U.S. Capitol last week. Before the largely symbolic vote, Pence rejected the call to arrest Trump from power, effectively paving the way for the House to move forward with impeachment. Shortly before midnight yesterday, the House voted largely along party lines to adopt the non-binding resolution that asked Pence to declare Trump incapable of executing the duties of his office and to immediately exercise powers as acting president. The final vote was 223 to 205, with only one Republican backing the measure. Moments later, Pelosi announced the team of House impeachment managers who would prosecute the case against Trump in the Senate. The team would be led by the Maryland Congressman Jamie Raskin, a former constitutional law professor who authorized the resolution and helped draft the article of impeachment against him. Early on Tuesday, the defeated president lashed out at Democrats for leading the effort to remove him before his term ends next week and took no responsibility for the violent uprising that left five dead and threatened the lives of members of Congress, congressional staff, law enforcement, journalists and his own vice president. I think that big tech is doing a horrible thing for our country and to our country and I believe it's going to be a catastrophic mistake for them. Uh, they're dividing and divisive and they're showing something that I've been predicting for a long time. I've been predicting it for a long time and people didn't act on it. But I think big tech has made a terrible mistake and very, very bad for our country. And that's leading others to do the same thing. And it causes a lot of problems and a lot of danger. Uh, big mistake. They shouldn't be doing it. But uh, there's always a counter move when they do that. I've never seen such anger as I see right now. And that's a terrible thing. Members of Congress gathered ahead of the vote on Tuesday for the first time since the attack amid heightened security both inside and outside the building. Cracked glass and newly installed metal detectors were reminders of the breach and of the continued threat of violence ahead of Biden's inauguration. Before the vote, lawmakers observed a moment of silence for the two Capitol Police officers who died after defending the building during the bloody siege. And now let's see our sports news with Abdul Aziz. Paul Pogba's second half volley was enough to give Manchester United victory at Burnley and send them three points clear at the top of the Premier League. United dominated a contest in which Burnley failed to register a single shot on target until stoppage time. But they were struggling to make a breakthrough until Marcus Rashford picked Paul Pogba with an excellent cross from the edge of the area. 
The Frenchman's connection was perfect, although he took a deflection off Matthew Lawton to ensure the ball went past Nick Pope into the Burnley net. Although Burnley had three decent chances in a frantic ending, United secured the win to head to the table after 17 rounds of matches. Atletico Madrid stretched their advantage at the top of the La Liga to four points with 2-0 victory over Sevilla. Diego Simeone's side took the lead when Angel Correa fired in after receiving a pass from England carrying Trippier, back in the team after a 10-week ban for betting breaches was suspended. Saul Niguez ensured victory over 76th minute with a thumping effort. It was the first defeat in 10 games in all competition for Inform Sevilla, who are 6th in the table. Atletico now have for 1 point from 16 games, for clear of 2nd place Real Madrid who have played 2 games more. Everton maintained their challenge for a Champions League spot with a victory at Wolves thanks to Michael Keane's 7th minute winner. The Toffees' 6th away win in the league this season lifted them to 4th in the table, level on points with 3rd place Leicester and only 4 off the lead held by Manchester United. They got off with a brilliant start when Alex Iwobi fired home in the 5th minute for his first goal in 38 Premier League appearances. Wolves seeking only their 2nd win in 8 games hit back in the 14th minute through Ruben Neves. The Portuguese midfielder ended his own barren run against Brighton at the start of January and made it two goals in two league matches with a sublime side-footed finish following brilliant movement from Brian Alenuri. And that is our news bulletin for this time. Thank you very much for being with us. I am Hamza Dabchere.